Good morning and welcome to Stone Creek. We're so glad that you're joining us today. My name is Gwenna. And I'm Jacob. And if it's your first time joining us, there's a connect link that we would love for you to click because we'd love for you to get to know more about us and we'd love to get to know more about you as well. And also there's a share button that you could click on and share with your family or friends. I'm sure they'd benefit from joining us as well today. Yeah, absolutely. And Gwenna, I, I think today's special because we are on the tail end of our Beatitude series. And this series has been absolutely phenomenal. I feel like there's been perspectives on the scriptures that have just made themselves known to me as Pastor Ricky and others have preached. And it's just great. In fact, I had somebody come up to me last Sunday just weeping at how good this series has been to them. And it just makes me think, only God, right? Mm, that's true. Only so. God. But we have something else to look forward to, a new series coming up. That's right. I'm super pumped about it. It's Making Wave series for the whole family in the July. Whole family. So you're not going to want to miss any Sunday because each Sunday has special elements and fun and exciting things. So It's true. And we're <laughs> concluding this series with a special baptism yes. service. It's going to be incredible. I mean, I'm super excited. There's actually gonna be a link in the chat. If you want to sign up for baptism today, go ahead and do it. If you feel like it's your next right step, go ahead and do what you feel like God is asking you to do. But nonetheless, I'm super excited. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be really, really good. Yeah, it sure is. But hey, we are about to go into a time of worship. But before we do, we want you to know worship isn't just with song and praise. It's also with our generosity. And so that's why we provide the opportunity for you every single week to give generously. In fact, there's four ways that you can give on the screen. Do whatever works best for you. But today, may God bless you as you give. Would you stand with us as we go into a time of worship? We pray that you are blessed and that God meets you exactly where you are. We'll see you later. Hey there, Stone Creek Church. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. Please stand while we lift his name, not just in song, but in new song.
We're raising our hands, we're lifting up our faces, we're just declaring that there's no other name but your name. Lord, the world cannot change without Jesus. And today, we want Jesus to feel like and know that he is the center of everything that's happening here this morning. Lord, we want to be light carriers, we want to be the salt of the earth. Lord, only you can do that through your church, Stone Creek Church, and the church in this twin cities of Champaign and Urbana. So, Lord, we just lift up the name of Jesus here. Lord, it's just the simple words that we are lifting up your name here is enough to inspire us to believe that though darkness covers the earth, the glory of the Lord has risen upon us thank you for the light of the gospel today that's penetrated our dark hearts at some point in our life and lord we are now new creatures new people just different snatched out of darkness thrust into light lord taken out of death and put into life god out of poverty and into your prosperity. God, we thank you, Lord. We lift up your name here today, Jesus. We lift up the name of Jesus here today. God, we lift up your name, Lord. You are a wonderful God to us. You're a wonderful brother to us. You're awesome in power, and all the dominion, and all the power, and all the glory belongs to you today. And we just give you praise now, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 
You can take your seats. The drummer made one mistake today. He gave us a random symbol, a, a, a really good point, and I had a flashback to before I was a Christian and I was listening to Black Sabbath. <laughs> Do you remember that album? Remember that album? I know, I know Donna knows that album. Uh, Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath, yeah. That album used to scare me when I was drunk. Oh, it used to terrify the living daylights out of me. Late on a Friday night, too, too much whiskey and orange, and that symbol. I'm going to need counseling, brother, after that. <laughs> hey, besides the random symbol, you did a great job, man. Thank you. I want Wilfred cranking up. I like listening to his guitar. Um, so, uh, this happy 4th of July non sorry, uh, news, sorry. In the lobby, Bertha Kent asked me, uh, are you doing anything great this weekend? I went, uh, I'll be praying for all of you <laughs> and fasting that you repent <laughs> and all 360 million of you come back to the Queen <laughs> and pay your taxes while you're at it. All right. So you can tell I'm not an American citizen, right? I do have a green card. I do have that. And so, uh, so anyway, being serious, come back to the Queen, all right? So, um, oh, we're in the last week. I was trying to figure out why I was here, yeah. So we're, we're in the last week, and I get the job of tidying up all Pastor Terry's mess he made and Pastor Ricky's mess. I've got to make sense out of what they were saying in 30 minutes. It's like the impossible job, isn't it? So um, just joking, just joking. And um, so we are final week of um, this series on the Beatitudes. And so um, I would like to talk about today, just for 30 minutes, uh, about how we live this out. And uh, so... I'm not stuck on one translation of the Bible. I don't even mind paraphrases. They, they help me. Paraphrases of the Bible, like the message, or I think the New Living Translation. Is that, is that a paraphrase, or is that an actual translation? Translation, is it? Yeah, great, thank you. Finally got a the theologian in the church. That was good. So if you're relying on me for that, you were in deep trouble. So I wanted to read to you from Matthew chapter 5. It feels like 200 verses but it's really worthwhile reading it, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so, chapter 5 begins, 5, 6, 7, eight, four chapters called the Sermon on the Mount. That's our title. And I think most people would agree it's probably Jesus' greatest sermon. He's sitting up on a mountain primarily, I think, talking to his disciples, and there's a crowd listening too. And this sermon, this teaching, is sandwiched, bookended by supernatural events. The end of chapter 4 um, is Jesus exorcising demons from people. He's healing the sick. He's doing all kinds of supernatural things. And it draws such a great big crowd that he has to go up, a mount, up the side of a mountain perch himself at the top so that people can hear him because the crowd was so big. So he sees the opportunity that supernatural living provided for him. I want to repeat that. He takes advantage of all these supernatural things happening to begin to teach people who didn't know what he knew and what God wanted to say. Don't think the supernatural stuff that Jesus did was just for then. Jesus actually said in his own ministry life, the three and a half years he was teaching and preaching, he said, you will do even greater things than these. And I don't know what that means. Is it greater in number? I don't know where else you can do greater than what he did. But he said, you'll do, you'll do these things as well. In the 11 o'clock service, that'll get, that'll get an amen. That will, right there, that'll get an amen. And uh, so it's bookended by um, supernatural things. When he comes off the mountain, a leper walks up to him. You can read it for yourself. I, th I think it's in chapter 8, beginning of chapter 8. The leper says to him, 
Hey, Jesus, if, he said, literally says this, if you are willing, I know you can hear me. And there's an English translator of the New Testament, uh, J.B. Phillips. He translated Jesus' reply like this. If I'm willing, what's this? If I'm willing, be healed. So he contests with the leper any doubt that Jesus' heart is towards healing people. In the end of chapter 4, before the Sermon on the Mount, it says everybody who came to him was healed. So already in your mind, you're going to be thinking about times where people weren't healed. But it does say everybody in those days leading up to the Sermon on the Mount who came to him were, were healed. We get into the Beatitudes, but first, there's a bit of an introduction in the message, it's, and it's from the Scripture. It says, When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. So, I could spend the morning literally talking about that little verse. It's amazing. He wants to teach them, so he climbs a mountain. And those who were his apprentices, and the literal translations, you would say disciples, but he calls them apprentices. And he says, they climbed the mountain with him. And they sat at the top. Now, it says quiet place. I can't imagine it's that quiet because there's thousands of people, or a, a big crowd trying to, trying to get close to him. But it's a place that's secluded. And that's where the presence of Jesus is. And discipleship, being apprenticed by him, is simply us climbing the mountain with him. It takes work. It takes desire. It takes discipline. It takes delight. And if you say yes and amen, I'm going to come and over here and I'll be right with you, you know. It takes desire. So I'm a big believer in this. If somebody's showing desire, there's two people involved. One is God. God is graciously stirring us up. Secondly, we're responding. <laughs> Thirdly, we're only responding because he began the work. But we do respond. And you know as much as I do, there are times for me and for you that we sense God stirring something in us and we don't respond. And therefore, there's no fruit. Nothing happens. But this journey to the top of the mountain, this apprenticing, is for everybody. And it takes discipline. Climbing a mountain. Some people get stuck at base camp. And they don't go any further. I just had a friend who's just raised tens of thousands of dollars by hiking up to the base camp in Mount Everest. And I said to my friend, hey, this, uh, this, fr this friend of ours, he raised all this money and he only got to base camp. He goes, Kev, base camp is higher than anywhere in America. I went, oh, okay, right. It's not by the side of the highway then. He went, no, no, it's like really high. He climbed a total of 49,000 feet up and down like this in altitude. 49,000 feet. He had desire. And his desire was, this is my friend, his desire was he wanted to raise money to be a blessing, to use that money to be a blessing for poorer people in East Washington, Peoria, Illinois. And he climbed a total of 49,000 feet. So he had the desire, he had the discipline to train, and he had the discipline to stick at it and got up to base camp, which apparently is more impressive than anything I've ever done, you know. So he had the discipline to do it, and then the delight comes. And I, I did hear this little phrase a long time ago, and little phrases stick with me. Discipline comes before delight. I'll go over to this side, Erica, because uh, you guys are a bit dead over there. Um, <laughs> discipline comes before delight. Amen. 
Careful, careful. Discipline comes before delight. Where's Wilfred? I thought, I thought you checked out, Wilfred. Discipline comes before delight. So I wasn't paying attention to Wilfred today like I was last time. Last time I was here, I heard every note. I was enjoying it. it was really, and I thought, you don't play a guitar like that without desire. You don't play a guitar like that without... You, we don't, he's only delighting in it now because he had desire and he disciplined himself to annoy his parents for years playing the guitar badly in his bedroom, right? And, his, and all his family said, yeah, somebody's in here. Somebody's, that sounded like a mother suffering right there. The committed, those apprentices, the committed climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God. <laughs> I like Jesus. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. I feel like I want to spend the morning just reading this. It's like, it's phenomenal. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. That's the you hunger and thirst for righteousness verse. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. Erica said, You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. That's purifying your heart and you shall see God. That's that verse. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. That's for all the political obsessed people in the room right there everybody said don't don't make me get pentecostal in here you're blessed when your commitment to god provokes persecution the persecution drives you even deeper into god's kingdom not only that count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me jesus what it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For they, though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds and know that you are in good company because my prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. Hallelujah. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, don't you think I'm going to... You don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Listen to this now. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So he brings them to a place where he introduces them through the Beatitudes with a new way of living. He says, come, follow 
me. He didn't say, go join the church. That's, that happens because you come follow him. He doesn't say, sign up for these Ten Commandments. Keep these rules. He says, come follow me. Everybody on the front row said, amen. Come follow me. That's a new way of living. He gives them a new purpose. I think this is the best line or the most important line in this message. He says to them, after he said, come follow me, he gives them a new purpose because he says the words, and I will make you. I will make you. There's a verse that they used to preach when I first became a Christian in the 1760s. feels that long ago. And they used to quote this verse all the time in this small Assemblies of God church that my wife and I became Christians in that was full of elderly people that loved me like I never felt loved before. I was 25 years of age. And these elderly people were so thrilled to have somebody young in the church. And you can tell I enjoy attention. So I, I liked it there, you know. And they used, whenever anybody preached, this verse always came out. Um, this verse always came out that I've forgotten. This verse, oh yeah. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my strength, says the Lord. So when he says, um, hey, he's these Beatitudes, he's, what he's really saying is, only I can make you. Only I can make this happen. You know, when you're raising teenagers, Wilfred, you may have been through this, I don't know. And your mom really wants you to be a Christian. And your mom or grandma really wants you to be a good Christian. And they tell you how you should be living. Not how it happens, but they give you the rules. I'm not, I'm not giving your mom a hard time. Or I'm not doing that, right? But that's what, that's what parents do. I did it. Johnny, don't steal. The Bible says don't steal, you know. Or Stevie, don't do this. Don't do that. And it's rules, expectations beyond human potential. We need God. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit. So, first thing he says, come follow me. It's a new way of living. Secondly, it's a new purpose. Only he can make us. You know the verse that's on your fridge, and you probably at some time it's been there. Uh, the work he began in you, he will complete it. And then every day we try hard to be this good Christian. But he completes it. I almost made a joke there and said, don't worry, somebody will come next week and balance this out. This doesn't need balancing, this one. He does it. The work he begins, he completes it. He throws these beatitudes, but he gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us this new birth to live it out. I'm keeping an eye on the clock, don't worry, because I know you've got barbecue on your mind, right? <laughs> and then thirdly, he gives us a new message, the Beatitudes. So, you know, um, people, say about, uh, people say, oh, how should we live? And Jesus said, you've heard it said, uh, hate your enemies or eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that kind of spirit, you know. He says, but I say to you, forgive them. He, says, he even says this, bearing in mind he's speaking to people who are occupied by the Roman Empire. He says, if anybody comes up to you, and they all know who he's talking about, if anybody comes up to you and says, hey, carry this bag for one mile, that's a thousand steps. Carry this bag for a thousand steps for a mile. He goes, if they come and ask you to do that, carry it two miles. And he, they knew who he was talking about, Roman soldiers legally could say to a member of the occupied people, the Jewish people, could say to them, hey, carry this bag, and they have to do it, or else there's major punishment. They have to do what they're told. And he's saying to them, because they all hate that, right? <laughs> they all hate it. And, he, and he's saying to them, don't just carry it one mile without even being asked, carry it two. That's only possible if God the Holy Spirit is alive and well, it's only possible if the old you is dead and buried and your flesh is the only thing fighting now and you allow God the Holy Spirit 
to empower you to live different. So the key word here today is going to be, Erica, surrender. That's, that's the key thing here. So there's a desire that God puts there. There's a discipline that God helps us with. There's a delight that we enjoy. He says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. So in other words, Joe, when you give up, that's when God takes over, isn't it? So I know, Angie, I'm praying for you very hard, right? I'm praying for you hard, man. She's a leader, right? She's always got an opinion, right? It's a good job me and her didn't get married, right? We would be in trouble. And it takes grace to be married. Every married person puts their hand up and says, Amen, Brother Kevin. It does. When my wife's here in the second service, because she's an art mart, because she can't bear to listen to me twice in one morning, and uh, when she's here, she'll be amen in at that point, right? Living to de- together takes the Spirit of God, doesn't it? Living amongst people who hate you takes the Spirit of God. Uh, I, I live in a neighborhood where most of my beliefs contrast with 97% of the population. So I have to be Jesus every single time I go into Starbucks and somebody hears my cute accent and wants to talk to me about American politics or race. And I go, Jesus, please take the wheel and help me not to be a jerk here. Lord, help me to ask questions rather than spout my opinions. And if you've known me for more than five minutes, you know I have opinions, right? But if we desire God, if we desire that to be at the end of our rope and surrender and let these qualities exude through us out into this dark world, revival will come. Bear in mind, it's bookended by the supernatural. Just living it isn't enough. It isn't enough. So I absolutely believe what I've just said. Just living it isn't enough. It has to be displayed in power as well as character. And character is crucial. It has to be displayed. Let me finish. I haven't really said much, have I? But at least you're going home. Not. What do you mean? No. I'm sure I can find something in these Beatitudes to rebuke you with right there. (laughs) An American missionary, uh, his name was E. Stanley Jones. I I I read this book a long time ago. I need to see you in my office right afterwards. (laughs) E. Stanley Jones, he said this. He was an an American missionary, and he was a friend of Gandhi. And he, quote, A little man in a loincloth in India, picks out from the Sermon of the Mount one of its central principles, applies it as a method for gaining human freedom, and the world, listen to this, by displaying one part of the Sermon on the Mount, and it it was one of the Beatitudes, the world challenged and charmed. Think about that. Challenged and charmed. The Jesus life through a man, I don't know whether or not he had faith in Jesus or not, but he puts this into practice and the world, challenged and charmed, bends over to catch the significance of this great sight. If somebody asks you to carry their bag for a mile, don't tut. Pick it up and carry it for two miles. If somebody says, you're an idiot for believing that, rather than slapping them across the face, ask them, why did you say that? What makes you think I'm such an idiot? Now, I I have had that, by the way. That's why I use that as an example, you know. When people come to you and steal from you, or slap you across the face, turn the other cheek. 
when the lady down the street gossips about you, take her some cookies, don't retaliate. Ooh, went quiet in here. I must have hit somebody there. <laughs> somebody metaphorically stabbed me in the back very badly, very badly. Hurt every member of my family, and it was 20 years ago. I have never... So, here's the thing. So, this is, this is where I do well. If you've got two hours to spare, I'll tell you where I fail. But I didn't fail on this one. I did really well. In 20 years, I have never criticized them or told the story in circles that they're in. Anybody they know has never heard from me what happened, what they did. I say jokingly, I'm an incredible human being, right? <laughs> it's Jesus, right? Now, if you've got two hours to spare, I'll tell you where I fail, right? But that one, I passed. If good works will get you into heaven, with that one, I'll be on the front row. In fact, here's, here's how I even look even better with this one. I, not only have I not criticized, as recently as Friday evening, I was boasting about them and things I had learned from them. No heckling this time. No heckling from the front row this time. It's amazing what Jesus can do with you. A friend of mine was a leader with Youth with a Mission. It's a Christian organization. They, send, they sent out teams of young adults all over the world. And uh, this friend of mine told me about a team. He wasn't on the team, but his friend was leading the team. And it was a group of Americans who went down to Argentina, and they were on the coast in this tourist town that was high-end tourists, high-end hotels. There was no poor people there. It was very classy, this place, you know. And they, they, had guitar, they, they were like dressed like youth of the mission people are usually dressed, a little bit like hippies and guitars with like the Holy Spirit dove symbol on their guitars and all that kind of stuff, and Jesus pins on the guitar strap. And they went on the street in the evening and were singing and preaching for three nights. Not, nobody paid attention. They just walked past them with their noses in the air, looking down on them as religious fanatics. On the fourth morning, this leader, of, who's, a friend, who's a friend of a friend of mine, he, he was like so frustrated. And a young woman on the team said to him, we should pray. We should spend the day in prayer and figure out why this is happening. So what did they do? They prayed. They repented about just coming with natural thinking. And then they, they said, here's what we're going to do this evening. We're going to leave the guitars behind. We're just going to go down there and we're just going to pray. So they got in a circle on the promenade there on the seafront. And they got in a circle and they started praying. And then one member of the team kneels down and starts asking God, to forgive the sins, her sins, the sins of the team, the sins of the people who live in this town. Then another member kneeled down, started crying. Before long, they were all kneeling down, praying and crying. And then they started to hear chatter, and they looked around, and hundreds of people had gathered around them in curiosity, heard their prayers, and started to kneel down with them and pray. A church was formed out of that first prayer meeting. It's the contrast, it's the counterculture of repentance, of allowing God to speak, of surrender. So people like me come with dramatic stories like that, but our general life is not like that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but it could be the neighbor down the street who's gossiping about you. Could be the two people around the photocopier, or do you still have photocopiers? If you have a photocopier still, they're still hanging around the photocopier or around the coffee machine, and they're talking about you, and because you, for whatever reason, and they're judging you and being harsh. That's when this kicks in. 
That's where we pray and say, Lord, forgive them. Lord, I choose to forgive them. Hello? Uh, so it's July the 4th. You're going to go now with your family, and you're going to gather around the barbecue. Guarantee there's one crazy uncle. <laughs> Guarantee there's that member of the family who talks about everybody, and there's this uneasy calm around there. And then after a few drinks, everybody forgets. You know, you lighten up, and what happens then? Everybody gets on, and then Monday you're thinking, why was I even talking to him? Why was I even nice to her? She's such a, and I can't use the word in America because it's cussing, right? And uh, so what, why, why was I behaving like that? It's because it's expected. There's another step into the unknown here, where God is. It's where we trust him to forgive. I'm not, yes, yeah, so I won't go down another road there, but just to say, it doesn't end with you. It begins with him. He, cha he changes stuff. He changes stuff. He does, honestly. He does. There was a girl in our very first youth group who was horrible. She was from a Christian family that was horrible. We were the youth leaders. We had full-time jobs, but we were the youth leaders. And my wife despised this teenage girl. She was 16. I said to my wife, Anne, why are you getting your knickers in a twist about this girl? She's 16, like, what the heck? She's 16. She didn't, she'll come back to you on, the, on a wedding day and say, I'm sorry I was such an idiot. But my wife could not get over this girl. My wife was a new Christian. She couldn't get over it. One time, this was the crunch. My wife's sitting in the front of this minibus. I was driving. We're taking these kids to this meeting. This girl and my wife get into this fight that my wife wanted to turn physical. That little girl who will sit there in the 11 o'clock service wanted to punch this girl's lights out. She undid her seatbelt, turned around, knelt down, and was reaching for her. So my wife got home, was crying about her behavior, and the next morning I woke up, and she goes, I'm fine now. I'm fine. God showed me. I have to start seeing people like her how he sees them. In the Beatitude somewhere, there's something like that where God the Holy Spirit will empower us to live differently. A neighborhood gathering in this church can transform a neighborhood just by living good and like this and listening to what God's saying about the people who live there. And he'll reveal things about your neighborhood, about families for you to pray for, and supernatural things will begin to happen to go along with our improving character and behavior. Out there, they are convinced we are bad people. The Beatitudes on display can change that. Amen? So, Wilfred, I think you're up again. I think. Bring your worship team back up here, Wilfred, and... Uh, Jesus, thank you today just for the person of the Holy Spirit. Thank you today that you are at work in us. The work you've begun in us, however long ago, you are the one who can complete it, perfect it, mature it. Lord, we don't want to be like that Galatian church that tries really hard when really the Holy Spirit is already here at work in us. We want to be people of the gospel that transforms communities in Jesus' name. Hey, um, I don't normally do this. Um... Hi, my name is Terry. What a wonderful message we just heard. We hope it was meaningful and life-changing. If you made a decision to follow Jesus today, we just want to celebrate with you. Let us know by following the link or the chat in the description below. We believe you've made the best decision of your life and would love to help you move forward in your walk with Christ. You should know that you're part of a praying church. Maybe you are watching this today and you need prayer, whether that's for you or a family member or a friend. We would be honored to partner with you for any need you have. You can share your prayer request by clicking the link in the chat. Now as we conclude our time together today, 
If you would like to know more about our church or would like to know how you can participate in what God is doing in our church, you can check out what we call Chapter 1. Every story has a beginning and this is ours. It's a perfect opportunity to learn more about our history and values here at Stone Creek. It's been a privilege to see you today and we can't wait to see you next week. But until then, may God richly bless you. Have a wonderful day.